Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to It's All About the Questions. I love, 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 this is my favorite time of the week, the firm favorite time of the day of the week. I love when I get to introduce you to new amazing people who can shift your perceptions around whatever it is their expertise is about. Sometimes it's not about their expertise, but about their experiences, because experiences drive your expertise. You have to just choose how you're going to take everything that has happened to you into your life and put it together in a way that you can help other people. And my guest today is no exception with that, and I'm so excited to have her on the show today. Her name is Diane DeResta. She founded Duresta Communications, but what's really cool is she helps people deliver high-stakes presentations, whether it's a one-on-one, whether it's in front of a crowd, from an electronic platform. She is the author of the um, best-selling book, Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. I think that's going to be my word of the day today, pizzazz, because how can you say pizzazz and not smile? So please welcome Diane to the show. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. It, it's great to have you on, and, and uh, this is what's kind of cool, because my um, my producer, engineer today, used to actually uh, be one of the engineers for um, the NFL. For, really? And you were, you're a media-trained sports and, and, and stuff. You've actually trained sports and entertainment celebrities in the NBA, NBA, WNBA, and USGA, not football, but, you know, we got kind of this sports thing going on in the studio yes. today. And I just did some work for the Philadelphia 76ers last week. So, uh, very exciting. Yeah, that is. You know, I love when synergies come together, you know, and you never know where they're going to come from. So, um, how did and, you, you know, how did you, you get you involved say, with doing presentations and helping people deliver knockouts? Well, I started as a speech pathologist. So, I went to graduate school to work with children in the New York City schools who had language and fluency disorders. And after about eight and a half years, I transitioned to the corporate market and started doing stand-up training and transferred my skills there. And little by little, I started my own business. And now I specialize in working with executives and leaders who give those high-stakes presentations and need to craft and deliver compelling messages. So I work with people either one-on-one in a, a coaching, consulting capacity. I do workshops and trainings for people like sales managers who need to get out there and be more influential. Or I also do keynote speeches to inspire and motivate and in- inform. And it's exciting work because more than ever before, Success depends on how well you present yourself, your message, and your value to the marketplace. You really can't avoid the skill anymore. And it used to be, I would see this in companies, people would delegate, a manager would want to speak and would delegate it to somebody. People want to hear from you now. You are the subject matter expert. And speaking is a form of your brand. And when I talk to people, I tell them, when you are an effective speaker, what you're doing is you're managing your brand. And today, speaking is the new competitive advantage. It is so critical for everybody. Well, and people, I think, don't realize that speaking isn't necessarily like what I do, where I do keynote speaking and things like that, or even on the radio, this is speaking. It's public speaking in a way. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. when you're in a grocery store. It's When you're in a doctor's office, it's somebody you meet on the street. All of that is a form of speaking, correct? Definitely. And I remember one time I was at an event where I had spoken, and I heard someone, I overheard someone talk about my presentation, and she said, well, I thought she was really good, but I'm not a public speaker. And I wanted to shake her and say, listen, do you leave voicemail? Do you give meeting updates? That's public speaking. People think it means you stand on a stage. No, it's exactly what you said. So it, we all need this skill. Now, it's been said, and I've never believed this because my mom said I was born with a microwave, microphone in my hand. 
<laughs> but that fear is one of the biggest stressors in people's life. And I got introduced to you by Bob and Christine Wright, who have mm-hmm. the wonderful podcast Stress Free Now. <laughs> yes. Have you really seen that, that speaking is something that literally paralyzes people? Yes, it does. But for most people, it's more of a nervousness or anxiety. There are some people who have a true phobia, and then that's a whole different area where you need to work more deeply and more intensely. But yes, it's so common. You would think it was most of the population. And so I was curious, and I went online and did a little research and found that it's really only about 7% of the U.S. population who has a speaking anxiety. But if you think about that, that's 27 million people. So I have more work to do. You have a lot and more work to do. Yes. Yes, I know. So, yes, it is a fear. And when I was writing my book, Knockout Presentations, I did an informal survey, and I asked people, why is it that you're afraid of speaking in public? And I would get answers like, well, all eyes are on me. What if I lose my train of thought? I, 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 I'm afraid I'll mess up. When I looked at the answers underlying that the answers, the underlying theme was fear of humiliation. And I think that's what it boils down to. And you often find, even with adults who have a fear, you can trace it back to an earlier memory. For example, I had a woman who was a very successful relationship manager in an investment bank, very good at what she did. But if she had to give a talk, she had to stand up in front of the group, it was paralyzing for her. And we actually traced it back to the seventh grade when her math teacher embarrassed her. So it wasn't even a public speaking event, but just that fear of humiliation in communicating in some way in front of a group transferred. So yes, it it is an issue, but the good news is you can change that. Not everybody has to stay stuck in fear and anxiety. Well, it's interesting that you said that because... As you were talking, I had this moment where I flashed back to when I was little on the sixth grade stage. I got roped into being the lead in a play, Aesop's Fallibles. And it was not that long after my brother died. And I just didn't want to be seen in public. But they're like, you're the only one that can do this. Because I had the best memory. And there was a lot of work in, in this role. And I remembered I... Inside the the box, I was supposed to be like a jack-in-the-box that popped up. I had put all the cheat sheets for myself, for all the cues, Mm -hmm. because I didn't trust myself. And I remember I popped up to say something and realized it wasn't my time to speak. (laughs) And I, as Uh, you were talking, I flashed right to that moment where, like, my heart was in my throat. I was mortified. And it was such a physical, visceral feeling. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I thought I forgot all about that. So that is fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Those Cynthia. memories are still with us. But here's the good news. When, when people have those anxieties, the way I work with them is I teach them recovery strategies. So, for example, I had a woman who said that you know, she was afraid. And I said, well, what are you afraid of? Let's get your worst fear here. And she said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to trip when I walk up to that platform. So I said, all right, let's imagine you do trip. What could you say? And so what we came up with was something like, I want you to know I've been practicing that entrance for weeks. Or you could say, never let it be said, I don't know how to make an entrance. Now, by having that ad lib line, the audience is going to laugh. Why? Because right now there's tension and it's comic relief. So they, are, they will be so relieved that you are not nervous and upset that that happened. So it's figuring out what's my worst fear, what could go wrong, and what could I do to recover. The most important thing is to be human. And I think one of the issues that people have is they think they need to be perfect presenters. Nothing could be further from the, the truth, Laura, because people can't relate to perfect, but they can relate to human. So when you have a, you make a faux pas, go with it. You know, put it out there. I, I sat back on a desk when I'm training. I've knocked over coffee. You know, I make a joke of it. So we all are going to have times when we mess up. It's how you respond that makes the difference. I love that. This is a great tweet. People cannot relate to perfect. They can relate to human. Yes. So be human and and let people know that you have these 
these errors and it, you know, if something happens, it's not the end of the world. It just means you're human. Move on. I, you know what I can get into mind? When I went to Nashville for the first time, I went to see a show at the Ryman Theater. It was about the Everly Brothers. In the moment, in the middle of a song, one of the two actors cracked. His voice cracked. After he finished the number, he said to the audience, and I want to thank you for accompanying me through puberty. <laughs> Everybody laughed. That was the end of it. Nobody would have said anything negative. It was brilliant. So those things happen in life. Again, it's how you recover. Uh, it uh, actually made him more likable because he was human. I love that. Um, you, would, uh, you and my guest from last week, Cynthia Mazzaferro, should definitely chat. I'll have to introduce the two of you because some of the work you do is similar yet different but very complementary talking about clearing through some of the past stuff that's stopping you from being able to do what you're doing. And she's, Mm -hmm. she's really, really cool. So we're going to go into our first commercial break and we're, we're talking with Diane DeResta, founder and CEO of DeResta Communications. She is so cool. She wrote this wonderful book, knockout presentations, how to deliver your message with power punch and pizzazz. And I'll tell you, this book is a compendium, it's the only way to describe it, of everything you need in order to deliver your best speaking ever. And that includes when you're at the grocery store and somebody says, so what do you do? Or who are you? It's really amazing. So we're going to be right back with more from Diane DeResta. Diane, before the commercial break, we were talking about this whole idea and concept about being human versus being mm-hmm. perfect when you're speaking and, and how to recover. I loved your story about the the singer at the Ryman Auditorium who mm-hmm. said, thanks for walk, joining me through puberty. <laughs> how does somebody who is so petrified about not being perfect, about making that stumble on stage, and I've fallen on stage, I've had all sorts of things happen since that sixth grade play, but obviously there's still a piece I need to clear there. Where I've just been like, oh, okay, you know, I've, I've said stuff I didn't plan on saying, and now I just go, well, that was for somebody, so if it was for you, please come meet me backstage afterwards, and let's talk about what I just said, because you were meant to hear it. But how, how do you help somebody work their way through that beyond the just figuring the worst? Say the last part again. Be, of- beyond them just working through what's the worst that could happen. uh well, it is a process, and I find that it has to do with mindset and skill set, and that's how I work. I break it down into actually a, a process I call the four M's, which is mindset, method, um, let me think, I'm, I'm blanking now. That's okay, mindset, you're human, right? Method. <laughs> yes, I'm being human now. Um, so there's four it comes M's. To me. But I have four M's that I, I work with on people. Okay, so let's and, talk about uh, mindset and method. The third one is method. Method. Okay. So mindset, method. Um, yeah, That's I will okay. come to me. That's all right. Anyway, and by the way, for all your listeners, I'm demonstrating what happens in real time when you lose your train of thought. Let me go, I, I will answer this, but let me go off for one minute. I was a professor at NYU, an adjunct lecturer. And at one point, they asked the professors to come and sit in front of a as a panel and talk about their courses to people who might be interested in taking them so i get to a point where i'm talking and i cannot retrieve the word i'm looking for and i for the life of me i knew what i wanted to say but you know when you just can't get it's on the tip of your tongue so i said to the audience so what's the word i'm looking for and someone gave it to me no deal you just go with it so anyway let's break it down to mindset and skill set. What happens is that first you have to work on the mind and it's because you have limiting beliefs that you're not good enough, you don't have the skills, someone's going to not like you and all of that. You need to work on the mind. So I want to identify what those beliefs are and then we write statements and start to practice those over and over. By the way, I also have... In my, I have a, an ebook called "Give Fear the Finger," and oh, it has that. <laughs> that's a New York title. It has links to videos, and one of the videos is an affirmation video. So when you buy that book, 
you can go and watch that video and it has music and it shows you the, the affirmations that you can say out loud. So the first thing is identify the, the limiting beliefs, start to create a new belief to work with. And the other part is skill set. And that's where we break down the skills so they know exactly what confidence looks like, sounds like, and, and how to speak the language of confidence. And I find that the more experience people have, the more confidence they have. Wouldn't you say that's true in your case? I would totally say that's a thousand percent true. Yeah, so the reason you can do what you do is because you had enough experience so that if something goes wrong, it doesn't throw you. And so we practice these skills until they're comfortable enough and they know exactly what to do. So it's as if you throw someone out there and you say, give a talk, and they don't know anything. So you teach people how to do that, how to structure their thinking. I give people templates so they can fill in the blanks so they know how to organize themselves. We work on how to handle their questions, but we work on a lot of the delivery skills, and we start small. So it's one-on-one. It's speaking in front of a few people, and then you graduate to a larger group. But a lot of it is managing your thinking first and then your skills. So here's something I say to every single audience. If you're nervous, you are being self-centered because it's all about you, yourself, or another way to say it is me, myself, and I. So when you're thinking like that, you're focused on you and not the audience. Your attention needs to be on what can I do for them. So I'd say get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about them, the audience. And when I've told people that, something shifts in their mind, and they say, yeah, no wonder I'm nervous. I'm thinking all about myself. And you need to change the focus. The other thing I know that happens is when people are being nervous, they're living in the future. Now, in order to be an effective speaker, you've got to be present. You have to be there right now with people. So it's as if you're talking one-on-one and you're looking someplace else. That's not being present. So what you do is when you are nervous, you start thinking of all the things that could go wrong. Oh, I hope I don't trip. Oh, what if I forget that word? Instead, come back to your breath. When people are going off into the future, we bring them back to the present by focusing on the breath. So I often start my coaching sessions with a small or short meditation so that people get back into their bodies. A lot of times people have an out-of-body experience because of their nervousness. You need to come back and be present and create that one-on-one. In other words, instead of looking at this big group of people, find one person that you can address. Find someone who's smiling at you. Don't try to convert the person who's scowling. Give it up. <laughs> Stay with the believers who are giving you the positive nonverbal. What about so the... That, that, that's one of the ways that I, I work with people. What about that old adage that just picture everybody naked? It never worked for me, but I'm curious what you think No. <laughs> Look at people naked or in, uh, in their underwear. No. That, that one person said, I tried that, and I started laughing out loud. So th- I don't think that's as effective. But perfectionism is a big killer, and it's more prevalent in women. And it was interesting. When I looked at some statistics, they said that of the, that 7% population of people who are nervous, 6% are male and 8% are female. So it appears that more women are nervous than men. I don't know if I've experienced that in my living laboratory, but I will say that perfectionism is more of an issue with women than with men. So we've got to get rid of the perfectionism and be more human. I think we can do a whole other show on women and perfectionism. It's something I'm in recovery from myself. <laughs> Oh, all of us. Absolutely. All right. So we, we've talked about the whole idea of grounding yourself essentially before you get on stage so that you can be present. It's not about you. It's about your audience and what you're delivering to them. And mm-hmm. th- I think the first half of our show really focused a lot on people cannot relate to perfect. They can relate to human. That is such an amazing quote from you i love that that is so tweetable and if i could tweet and do my show live i would do it so whoever is listening out there please go tweet that those of you who are are listening my handle is at speaking pro okay perfect at speaking pro and i am at the laura stewart so that's perfect when we come back diane 
I'd love to talk about this concept you talk about in your book, Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz, of the speech sandwich. I will. I love that. It's just so visual. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading it in the book, I went, oh, this is such a great way to break it down to make it easy for people to put their speech together. Just think of it like the perfect yummy sandwich. And we'll be Mm -hmm. right back with more from Diane DeResta, author of Knockout Presentations. And welcome back, everybody. It's exciting to uh, bring you back to, with my show. And we've got Diane DeResta. If you're just joining us live on the air, if you're on the podcast, this was instantaneous, but you heard me say that before. So, Diane, there's a concept in your book called the speech sandwich. I loved it. <laughs> I could literally sink my teeth into it. Ha, ha, ha. I thought it was really great how you described the different parts of the speech in a speech sandwich. Can you take us through that? And how you developed that idea? The way I developed it is I'm a foodie. Everything I talk has to do with food. So the reason this came to me is because one of the biggest issues I deal with in my work is people who can't get to the point. And I have to say the last four executives, the most recent people I have had coaching relationships with, all had the same issue. And now what happens is when you can't organize your thoughts clearly in a way that's sequenced, And to the point, you lose credibility and you lose the message. So this speech sandwich has to do with your messaging. And so I say to people when I'm talking in front of groups, if you went into a delicatessen and you ordered a sandwich, let's say a roast beef sandwich, and you opened it up and on the top of the roll was a piece of roast beef, you'd say, what is this? That never happens, and yet that happens all the time with speaking. They start with the middle or the weeds, and the audience gets so confused. So you need three distinct areas whenever you're talking to anybody. It's your beginning, your middle, and end. So if you think of a a sandwich or, let's say, a Kaiser roll, and if you put some meat in the middle, let's say we put a roast beef, turkey, then we put a little cheese, and then we put some lettuce and tomato, and then you're going to have some mayo – The thickest part should be the middle. And the top and the bottom of the roll are pretty much the same volume. So your opening and your closing should be very quick, very brief, concise. And you you sandwich in the details, the examples, the evidence, the stories in the middle. And that's where you spend the bulk of your time. First, you have to set it up, the top of the roll. Then you go into the details, and then you have to be back so they remember where you've taken them. So think of the lettuce and tomato are as the embellishments, such as the, the stories or the analogies or the examples. And the same thing with the, the mayo or the dressing, so that you have a complete sandwich. And when you think of that, then that's something you can sink your teeth into as you sit. So what we're talking about here is a formula for you to organize your thoughts and have a succinct and compelling message. So going back to earlier when I was talking about my method, my 4M method, and I totally blanked, it has come back to me now that when I work with people, I work on their the message, the messenger, the method, and the mindset. And I have to say, Laura, I'm really glad that I blanked out. And the reason I'm glad is because... People need to know that this happens to anybody. I've been working over 20 years. I am a certified speaking professional. That is a designation from National Speakers Association that is given to, that's held by less than 1% of speakers worldwide. And if that can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. So I want to assure people that this is going to happen. Things happen, but it's how you recover. And so please don't let that stop you from moving forward and creating your own speech sandwich. Is that where the vocal interrupters come from? I know that's something that I've been very fortunate. I don't have a lot of, but yesterday I was helping somebody with something and I just kept saying, um, and a few other things. And it's because I was having trouble getting my brain wrapped around what I was trying to do with them because I was quite tired. Are vocal interrupters a way of us trying to fill in those blanks to find what our brain is missing? Yes, and I call those non-words. You can call them anything you want. And I have that in one of my chapters, I believe chapter two, we talk about that. I would say that there are two things. One is 
people are not prepared, so they don't know their message, and so they're grappling for words. More, and an even more common reason, even when people are prepared, is people are afraid of silence. And I work with people to master the pause. People say, um, because they want to fill in the space, and it has a negative impact. They don't understand that just because they pause doesn't mean that people think they forgot what they said. It is a really important skill. So, yes, whenever you're tired or fatigued, you're going to have a lot more of those as well. So I would say if you want to be an effective speaker, you need to get enough sleep, you need to be prepared. I'd say the number one issue is people don't prepare enough. And I've had executives say to me, a CEO of a company said something about, you know why I love working with you? Yes, you're a good coach, but it forces me to work on my presentation. So what he was saying is because he had paid for coaching, he now had appointments where he had to prepare, whereas before he'd be on a plane looking it over last minute. So you need, in building your speech sandwich, you need to be prepared. And that's why I wrote my book, Knockout Presentations, to be a seminar in a book. It's literally the best thing to having me there. If you can't have me live, it's the next best thing. And the exercises are there. The checklists are there. The do's and don'ts are there. The templates are there. So I can't give you anything better than that than to be with you personally. Well, we've got you on the air today, so it's like being with you personally. <laughs> <laughs> In your book, you lay, you even had layouts, and I, I love that. You had, here's some ways to lay out a room if you're speaking, and, and here's why it's effective. I think that is so wonderful. Now, there's all different ways of doing speaking. This is in a more formal presentation. It, whether you're in a boardroom, whether you're in an auditorium, whether um, I've spoken in front of book groups and all of that stuff. And, you know, I've been on stages in front of 10,000 people. But do you always need visual aids or not? No. No. And I think we've been PowerPointed out. And I say that as a user of PowerPoint. But a lot of times when I, I do most of my work in corporations, and so corporations are reliant on PowerPoint. They usually have standard PowerPoints that are created and people are supposed to use them. And they're terrible. And so here's the key word in visual aid. The word is aid. It's not supposed to overtake the speaker. And it should be adjunct. So I'd say use fewer slides. The exception to that is when you're doing a webinar, then you need more. But when you're presenting live, you want fewer slides. You want them to be more visual, photographs, symbols, graphs, with very few words on there. Most of the slides I see are horrendous, and they're full of text. And so I, I remember I was speaking to a, it was the Voice Foundation. It was a nonprofit organization of speech scientists, uh, doctors, speech pathologists, voice coaches. And the problem was these scientists would get up and read their papers. And I stood on the stage and said to them, I can read as well as you can. If that's what they to do, they don't need... They don't need to be there. So when you read a slide, you're actually making yourself obsolete. Because given a choice, the audience will always read ahead of you. So if you're going to speak to every word that's on the slide and read it, they're ignoring you and they're reading ahead. So make them dependent on you. Let that slide be an adjunct. It can be a very powerful resource, especially if there's a photograph or if there is a graph or a video. But don't put your whole script up there. So don't worry that you won't remember what you're supposed to say. That's where those other pieces of the speech sandwich come in when you've practiced and you know your topic. Yes, you need to be prepared, and it's 90% preparation, only 10% delivery. And that's why, again, in the book, I give you all of those tools so that you can prepare and know how to use things, how to use tools, how to put the speech together, how to do your PowerPoint. TED Talks have become such a huge part of society today. They, you know, they're short, they're powerful. Some of the TED Talk people have, you know, hundreds of millions of hits on their videos and others don't. What do you think it is about TED Talks that have transformed the way people think about presenting, speaking, and topics? 
Well, they now, the TED Talk is traditionally 18 to 20 minutes, so that has caught on, and I think that's a good thing because our attention span is now one second less than a, a goldfish. I think a goldfish <laughs> is eight seconds and we're seven seconds. Pretty pathetic. But with all the technology, we have become so wired that we cannot attend. And it makes it harder today for speakers to hold an audience. You need to come up with ways to engage an audience, to get them active. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. So the TED Talks are great. They're entertaining. I don't think that people all people need to give them but it's a great resource I, I encourage people to to learn by going online and watching them but again speaking is a leadership skill and and you can't afford to be without this it, it's truly your your competitive advantage and when I was doing some research on fear with males and females I, I looked at it was Columbia University I believe was talking about social phobia impact and they said that when you have public speaking anxiety, it has a 10% impact on your wages and a 15% impairment on promotion to management. And I see this all the time. When people are referred to me, executives, leaders, what happens is they have stalled. They're, they've plateaued at a level and they can't get to the next one because they either don't look, sound, or act the part of a leader. And that's when we get to work and work on their executive presence, helping them to create that speech sandwich so they can get to the point. I had one person who was a CFO, newly promoted, very good at what he did. However, he couldn't get to the point. So when he would talk in these partner meetings, their eyes would be rolling and he would lose credibility. So we had to show him how to speak to the point and to talk in terms of what was important to the listener. And that's a whole piece we haven't really addressed, which is chapter three in my book. I think it's chapter three, knowing the audience. That is key. And if you don't know who you're dealing with, if you have not profiled your audience, it's going to be harder and harder for you to be effective as a leader and as a speaker. I love that. So and we're going to use that to, to go. We're going to use it to go right into our last commercial break. We'll be more. We'll be right back with more from Diane. And do you know who your audience is? I do. It's you. We'll be right back. Diane, you know, we were talking about TED Talks and this whole concept of getting your message together, getting your speech together. What about who you're presenting to? You started to talk about that a little bit at, at the end about knowing your audience. How does somebody begin to gather who that audience is? I would say, Laura, that this is the weakest part for everybody. They spend a lot of time on their content and standing up and practicing, but not really delving into who is the audience. And I remember a client of mine said, oh, you know, you weren't here the other day, and I was thinking, what would Diane say? She'd say, well, who's your audience? What do they care about? And I help people to define and identify the hook that's going to engage the audience. So the, you asked me, how, how do you do that? In my book on audience profiling I ha, or audience analysis, I have questions to ask in terms of what's important to learn about the audience. But some general things you want to know is, first of all, why are they there? What do they care about? You know, what are their hot buttons? What, what are the demographics? You want to know basic things like male to female ratio, size of group. You want to know the, the setting because all impacts on the presentation. What are their attitudes? Meaning, how do they feel about your topic, about you, about being there? Very important because you want to address those things before they can become problematic. So what is their world like? Now, when what, you're- what do they do? Now, when you're media training a sports or an entertainment celebrity, do they know who their audience is, or is that something that you have to help them figure out as well so that they know what they're going to say? I would say both. They often will know who they're, they're going to if it's a particular interview, but then they may not. If it's in general to get someone up to speed, then you're talking about what's different about, say, print or or television or radio and again it's always about knowing the demographics of that market so when you're on a particular radio who's who are the demographics for that if you're in a particular magazine or 
newspaper, who's reading that? Because that's who you want to address. Are these sophisticated sports fans or is this the general public? It's always about the who. So if you're being interviewed for Sports Illustrated versus the New York Times versus People Magazine, you're going to want to change a bit about what you're saying is what you're, I believe, you're talking about. Okay. Yes, the stories, the language you use, the stories and examples you use. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, it really doesn't matter if we have a a female audience or a male audience, and I dispute that because then I tell stories about examples people have given that did not resonate because of gender or because of age. So you have to really know your audience. Yeah, because a story you might tell on my show may not play as well on Howard Stern. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Or if you're talking to a young group, then you better know who who the the new artists are when you're giving examples. So years ago, I used to, when I talked about a breathy voice, I could say Marilyn Monroe and everybody would know what I was talking about. You had an image. Today, there are people who don't know who she is. She's long gone. So you have to find current examples that your audience can relate to. So here's another example. I was at an event and we all thought that this presenter was very good. And some of the younger people didn't. I said, really? What didn't they like? They said, well, he didn't use technology. So the fact that he didn't use technology in their minds made him not so effective. So it's important to know your audience and what did they value. And that's how you have to show up. So that's part of the method. That's part of the message. It's about you as the messenger who you in, in that situation. And it's also your method. How are you going to present? So all of that is very important. And mm-hmm. most important is the why, speaking to them in terms of what's in it for them. So here's something to be aware of. On an unconscious level, audience is usually thinking three things. Thinking, who are you? Friendly. Do I like you? They're thinking, who are you to tell me? In other words, how have you earned the right to be here? And the third question is W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? Why should I sit here for the next 20 minutes and listen to this presentation? What am I going to get? So Knowing that in advance and being able to address that up front helps you to engage and keep the audience with you. That's a perfect way to get close to ending the show. There is so much great information in your book, which is Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. And I still love saying that that title of your book because it's so great. How can people... (laughs) Find your book, purchase your book, and also you have your ebook, Give Fear the Finger, and reach out to you if they have questions or need some help preparing their speech sandwich. Well, you can go to Amazon and you will find the book. We have the hardcover, we have the Kindle version, we have the ebook, Give Fear the Finger. Uh, this is that strictly confidence building, whereas the uh, knockout presentations is everything from soup nuts. You can also find me on Twitter at Speaking Pro. You can find my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Diane DeResta. But go to my website, DeResta.com, D I R E S is in Sam, T is in Thomas A, and you'll be able to find me always. Okay, say the website one more time DeResta.com, D as in David, I R E S is in Sam, T is in Thomas A. Dot com. That's perfect. So, Diane, last thought you'd like to leave my listeners with? I would say that while gifted speakers are born, effective speakers are made. Anybody can be an effective speaker, and people need to have the skill. If you are avoiding it, don't. Go get help. Read a book. Go to Toastmasters. Go on YouTube. Hire a coach. Go to a seminar. But get your skills going and I want to wish everybody success on the platform of life and may every presentation be a knockout. Oh, I love that. At the end of your book, you have amazing resources for people, checklists, everything that somebody could possibly need to put things through, including a list of resources of places where you can go like Toastmasters and mm-hmm. other local groups to, to speak to. And I, I again, like practicing in front of a mirror. I think that works too. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Well, now you have cell phones and you can just videotape yourself. But the best thing is go to my website, send me an email if you have questions, and I mean, I'm happy to answer. That's great. This book is Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. I think it's something that every speaker should have a copy of this book just because it reminds you to be present. Don't get overwhelmed by it. It can, it can be a little overwhelming because there's so much juicy content in there, but it's breaking it down. And as Diane, you, you so wonderfully said, people cannot relate to perfect. They can relate to human. So no mm-hmm. matter what you do, you have to be yourself when you're speaking. So I think, Try not to pretend to be somebody else when you're up there on stage. Speak your truth. Speak your power. Speak from from your voice, not somebody else's. Don't try to pretend to be some famous speaker. Be yourself. And be fully present. Have a conversation with the audience. That's all it is. I I love that. And if, like what happened to me, you fall flat on your face literally um, (laughs) on stage when your shoe trips on something... Just sit there and laugh, and the audience will laugh if you get up, and everything will, I promise you, it will be good after that. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and remember, the right questions can truly change your life. So what are you asking yourself today? Have a great day, everyone. See you next week. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 